sorry, uh, respected senior consultants and dear friends, sorry for the delay. And uh, due to technical reasons, I think from the CIPLA team, the program been taking over in slightly delayed phase. Um, it's really a great pleasure for me to be in this forum uh, organized by Team CIPLA. My intention to discuss about the basics of inflammatory bowel disease that what we are facing right now in our current Indian scenario is one of the most complex disease entirely to tackle, even for the best of gastroenterologists when you're going to see this presentation. Why I would chosen this, why I've chosen this topic as a key presentation today, because last one month itself, we haven't seen more than 10 to 15 cases of IBD. It could be in mild phase or moderate phase or severe phase. We have been coming across for the past one to four months, around 10 to 15 patients we have seen. So the, the tendency, the frequency is almost going high for this inflammatory bowel disease, even in Asian scenario. So what is the reason? So what do you mean by IBD? Is there any treatment for that? It's always a chronic, progressive, immune-mediated disorder along with which will be having a preponderance, a chronic relapsing with remitting inflammation, which can affect any part of your, any part of your gastrointestinal tract. As you are well aware, it is broadly categorized into two major entity as Crohn's as well as ulcerative colitis. How to differentiate, how to recognize the presentation at an earlier point of time even for the practicing physicians or practicing surgeons or being here, it's my primary interest to discuss with you all about the basics, how to recognize the clinical presentation at the earlier phase. As you all know, inflammatory bowel disease, once the patient been diagnosed, it's the treatment has to be gone for lifelong sometimes with regular follow-up monitoring. Sometimes the patient will go for relapse. Sometimes the patient will be out of remission all those events to be monitored in a proper way if you want to manage a patient with IBD. But usually the peak age will be right from pediatric, even in age of around 60 to 70 years, there will be high preponderance. But usually the age of onset from pediatric up to young adult as well as adolescent phase will be more common. And this is the area we should not miss out the clinical presentation. So the sex ratio will be, uh, most of the time will be equal once you're going to take on with UC, but may, male predominance may be seen once a week. Yeah. Yeah. So make yourself mute, please. And uh, the basic things you're not supposed to forget. If you're seeing your Crohn's, it can affect any bone from your mouth to anus. But large bowel predominantly been involved in ulcerative colitis. And in Crohn's, it can be from mouth to esophagus, stomach, and sometimes even a small bowel, ileum, and all those areas along with your large intestine involved. But usually, you can be able to recognize the Crohn's disease is one of the one most complex and easy to tackle because a wide range of presentation, wide area of clinical assessment. Sometimes the diagnosis may not lead you to the clinical pointers. So always you need to be conscious when you're going to tackle a patient with Crohn's. And it can affect all the layers of your bowel wall from your mucosa, submucosa, and all the layers of your bowel wall can get affected because of your Crohn's. And you can able to identify frequent skip areas and intervening normal mucosa when you're going to tackle a patient with Crohn's. But in, you see, the inflammatory lesion will be predominantly continuous, but not patchy. Then, as you all know that the inflammation predominantly affects the inner layer mucosa of the bowel wall. And the lesion predominantly restricted to large bowel as well as in rectum. Is it so? Why do you want to distinguish these Crohn's as well as UC? Because most of the time, the treatment regimen protocols will be the same, but why do you want to distinguish? Because the event, the progression, the changes, whether the patient is going to have worsening of events, whether the patient can develop extra GA manifestations, what sort of medical management, how are you going to assess the response rates 
what in case if there is involvement of other portion of your GA tract, how to recognize the presentation? In case if the patient is going for any surgical intervention, how to recognize that? And if you are planning for a surgical procedure, once the patient is going to land up with any complication, what are the various surgical procedure? What kind of procedure you are going to plan? That's the area we need to check on. That's very important. We need to distinguish the between these two major entirely. One is your UC and one is your Crohn's. Incidence and prevalence continuously raising in, uh, rising in Asian continent. But why I would like to point out this, when compared to the initial presentation nowadays, the innovation of various advanced endoscopic techniques along with your biomarkers being diagnosed in an earlier phase. So we can be able to recognize this IBD-like presentation at a higher point now when compared to the initial period. Now, the incidence of high BD is equal and is almost higher in the Western world, in the affluent population. But nowadays, even our Asia has been catching up, our Indian, our and uh, Europe has been showing a higher prevalence of UC than Crohn's, whereas the opposite is true for Australia. So briefly about the historical timelines of your Crohn's and UC, if you're going to see the Wilkes introduces the term UC, but as the day progresses, what you're going to see, IBD becomes a global disease by increasing prevalence and in industrialized countries most of the time is getting involved and Westernized nations now it's being almost equivalent to your Asian continent is also being a rising trend. When you're going to manage a patient with IBD, either because of Crohn's or because of your UC, you should know the basic things. How do you going to recognize the presentation? So for everything, there might be a classification for the basic area of involvement to assess the severity of disease and to categorize the management process. For Crohn's disease, basically, if you're going to look into that, there is a classification, what is called as Montreal. It is based upon at what age you're going to get into the disease and where is the disease being primarily located and what pattern, whether it is stricturizing or penetrating or whether there is any fistulizing. See, if you are going to look into the Crohn's, the bottom area is predominantly well involved. So like your fistulizing lesions, your abscess, your fissure, other complications, your complex fissures, so many other complications can develop because of your Crohn's. We are not supposed to forget. The age of diagnosis from 16 to 40 years, location from ileal to iliocolonic and isolated upper GI. There are the various areas now L4 can be considered as a modifier that can be added to L1 and L3 in concomitant upper GA is going to be added. But what are the various common symptoms? As we all know, anything which is going to happen in your small bowel will be always a pathetic one. Patient will be having significant weight loss. So you should be very cautious to tackle a small bowel. As you all know that the length of your small bowel will be going almost approximately 4.5 to 5, 6 meters in length. So there's such a big area, it's very complex. There's so much of complexity to identify. Even with your capsule endoscopy, even with your single balloon or double balloon endoscopy, even with your MR as well as your CT entrography, there are high possibility for you to miss out the lesions in your Crohn's. So recognizing the presentation at the earlier phase is most important to prevent major complications. So small bowel pathology, there might be having evidence of diarrhea, crampy pain, as well as weight loss. In, if the patient is going to have predominantly large bowel, the characteristic event will be your lawyer, lawyer GA bleed, as well as, as I discussed with you all, sometimes your ulcer, abscess, fissure, fistulizing, and all those events can happen but significant weight loss once the patient is going to take on with your predominant small bowel and gastroduodenal region. So how to recognize this activity, the CDAI. It's nothing but your Crohn's disease activity index. If you're going to look into this picture, see if you have, there are various scaling systems being marked, but if you're going to see that based upon your stool pattern, how much of episodes, how many episodes you're going per day, apart from your pain nature, along with your well-being, with various complications. But we are not supposed to forget whether you're going to face any mass or whether the patient is going to be on any opioids or any other antidiarrheal, along with your amateurcrete, as well as your standard deviation changes from your weight. All those things can be taken into an account based upon that. You need to have a scoring. 
once the patient is going to be on CDA, if it is going to be more than 450, which means if the CDA, if it is going to be 450, which means the patient may have, may have worsening of events, the persistent symptoms, even with your treatment, even with your biologics, even with your steroid, the patient have worsening of events, the patient may have persistent fever, vomiting, obstruction, pedal signs, all those complexity may happen. But in case if the patient is going to land a only mild to moderate or mild moderate to severe, at that point, you need to assess your clinical picture based upon your CDAI. But coming to your UC, it's based mainly, it's, if you're going to look into that, it will be predominantly involved in the mucosal component. So the large bowel, most of the time, the rectum is going to get involved. So if you're going to have predominantly proctitis or left-sided, if it is going to involve up your splenic flexure, or if it is going to be a pancolitis, so you need to look into extensive colitis. If the patient is going beyond your hepatic, which means it's nothing but your extensive colitis is going to get taken on. And there is one terminology, what is called as backwash ileitis, right from a basic knowledge. In case if you are going to identify your histological inflammation, which extends from the cecum into the ileum in a UC patient, along with evidence of extensive colitis, which means nothing but backwash ileitis is one terminology being taken on. Montreal's classification being used for your UC, if you're going to see that, based upon your area of involvement and based upon your severity. So based upon your rectum, your left side and extensive, once the patient is going beyond the splenic flexure, which means the problem is going to be extensive pancreatitis. For the patient with evidence of extensive pancreatitis, if the patient is going to have endoscopically completely distorted mucosa, your vascular pattern, if it is going to get altered, your, your evidence of any, uh, so much of even pseudopolypoid lesions, other things, afteroid ulcerations, there are so many other complications you may report when you're going to do an endoscopic evaluation of your lower GI in UC. So based upon your severity, how to recognize the severity, one based upon the clinical parameters and the next one based upon your lab parameters. So clinical parameters always the vitals, monitoring your stool pattern along with your hematocrit, you mean hemoglobin and ESR and your clinical hemodynamics, like your temperature, pulse rate and all those things to be assessed properly. If you want to categorize the patient for mild UC or moderate UC or severe UC. So severe UC is nothing but if the patient's continuously passing stools, more than six, along with your pulse rate, if it is going to be more than 90, your temperature, if it is going to be high, and in face of anemia, if your ESI, if it is going to be more than 30, that means the possibility of worsening of events in the background tends to be more severe once the patient is going to land up with evidence of ulcerative colitis. So what is this Mayo scoring? That is another, another scoring system to assess the severity. Is nothing but based upon your frequency of stool along with your bleeding pattern and what you're going to do in your colonoscopy with your global assessment scale. So with that, we can able to identify your Mayo score. If, the, if you're going to see obvious blood loss, which means the score is going to be more than two. And uh, endoscopy, if the patient is going to have marked erythema with vascular inflammation, with extensive friable mucosa, with spontaneous bleeding and ulcerated findings, which means the patient may score is going to touch almost around three. And these are all the basic clinical assessment we are not supposed to forget, but any IBD patient, we should not miss out the extra GA manifestation because it's a chronic immune mediated relapsing pathology in which the treatment most of the time has a long standing duration. So at any point of your management protocol, the patient may have evidence of extra intestinal manifestations, which is very important to recognize the clinical presentation because, for example, trotting from your head to foot, the commonest presentation like your ileitis and uveitis with afters also your thyroid related problems are very important dangerous events like your primary sclerosing cholangitis in which your alkaline phosphatase tends to be high, your bilirubin tends to be high along with the evidence of cholestatic picture. If you're going to have more pruritic and other symptoms, 
and once a patient is going to be evidence of autoimmune pathology, for example, your IgG4 tends to be going high, along with overlap syndrome, and sometimes your rheumatological clues like your joint pain, zero negative, zero positive, and cardiac involvement. For example, your myocardial is pericardial. The evidence of inflammation is going to happen everywhere and every organ. And never forget about the dermatological clues like your erythema nodosum, very common in your IBD, uh, in Crohn's. If you're going to see in the shin, your tendon nodules, there is high possibility, and pyoderma gangrenosum, which the gangrenosum buttock region and other thing, even the soul, um, yeah. even the legs, if you're going to identify, there is high possibility for you to consider. You see, so why I would like to point out this picture. So huge list of extra GM manifestation is there, but it will be more common of 25 to 40% of the population who are being evidence of IBD to be identified. But one EIM, one extra GA presentation will increase the risk of second extra GA presentation. So always you need to screen based upon that. We need to escalate our therapy, whether the patient is on steroids. We need to assess whether the steroids will worsen this event or not. If the patient is on antibodies, monoclonal antibiotic support, for example, your biologics, we need to see whether the patient is developing any evidence of septic focus or any evidence of extra GA manifestation. And sometimes the extra GA manifestation may worsen because of your biologics too. So always you need to assess your clinical presentation when you're going to manage and you always need to rule out evidence of septicemia, septic shock and other presentation. Once a patient is going for evidence of severe uh, blood loss in the background of this kind of event. And complications of IBD, as you all well know, one is because of your EC, UC, and another one is because of your CD. <coughs> the predominant UC will be because of your toxic megacolon and perforation, your hemorrhage and carcinoma, hot water. And in Crohn's, you may have evidence of fistula, abscess, your intestinal obstruction and bowel perforation that you're not supposed to get forget. And the basic etiology assessment, the risk factor, the pathophysiology, what is that? So we have not yet come to the conclusion, what is the predominant cause? Whether it is because of your genetic manipulation or because of your immune alteration or because of the environment in which you are going to expose or is because of the new one, the new entity, the new mind, what is called as the intestinal microbiota in case if it is going to get altered. So all these things to be taken into an account if you want to identify the predominant etiological factor, but it's always a multifactorial in which you couldn't, you couldn't able to identify a single factor, you couldn't point out a single factor to identify this etiological risk. And what are the genetic factors? As you all know, once upon a uh, among relatives, there is high prevalence in monozygotic and uh, monozygotic twins that might be having evidence of high prevalence. And based upon your, uh, you mean the Jewish population, Ashkenazi population, all those things that might be having evidence of high prevalence and genetic factors like your huge list of genetic mapping been made out for this IBD. There is no, no one single idea entity been identified, huge list of genetic makeup, prominent pathway based upon your non-depleted domain. And there are so many other areas of mutations you need to identify in your genetic pathway for assessing the risk. Common things, sometimes the smoke even may protect your UC, but that might be having evidence of worsening of events based upon your diet, your smoking pattern, your gut microbiota, your UV exposures and metal exposures and air pollutants, and along with various medications where you're going to consume and pass is your appendectomy and psychological factors and your physical activity. All those things might be having a predominant possible clues, but we can't label them as single entity to assess your severity. Apart from that, one important entity we are not supposed to forget the gut microbiota now it's well preserved as you know the alteration of your gut microbiota being taken with multiple pathophysiological events right from your liver for example your alcoholic liver your yeah. so many other possibilities yeah. you're right now even in management of IPD uh, ephemicals and bacteroids which is going to be predominant and contribute to the production so make sure that you're going to be in mute mode please Mute them, mute them, 
So in Crohn's disease, the microbiota, what is going to happen? There might be evidence of a pharmacons as well as your bacteroids tends to go down. But once the representation of enterobacteria, it tends to be high, that might be predisposing to your Crohn's. In you see a reduction of Clostridium and an increased E. coli has been reported. So once what is going to happen, this gut microbiota, in case if it is going to get changed, at that point of time, the immune response gets altered. That might be having evidence of IBD, which tends to get worse now. So remember this simple flowchart. I don't want to make this pathophysiology very complex right now in this discussion, because our primary intention when we are going to wind up is you should know the basic clinical pointers of recognizing the events, identifying the nature, basic workup, how to proceed, and what is the first line of management in case when you're going to refer the patient promptly to the gastroenterologist, and what is the new advances. That's the main area for me to take on, but Briefly, you should remember one the gut microbiota. If it is in case, if it's going to get disrupted, how are you going to have the presentation? See, this is normal intestinal human bio, normal bacteria, cell along with your anti inflammatory bacteria and various pathogens. The mucus layer is always going to be having a protective effect, even if it is going to get disrupted, the deficit barrier is going to get taken on, and your various immune response is going to get augmented. At the physiological inflammatory pathway is going to get taken on to maintain your homeostatic mechanism in your lamina propria. So what is going to happen once the patient is going to land up with the evidence of worsening of events based upon your genetic alteration, your environmental factors, your microbiota is going to get disrupted. That might be evidence of your T helper and interleukins if it is going to down and T helper cells if it is going to upregulate, which means what is going to happen there might be evidence of chronicity in inflammatory pathway, which will predispose the patient with slow, continuous, evolving, penetrating, cicatrizing, worsening of lesions, as we are discussing in your IBD. What does that to take on? But regarding the diagnostic, how are you going to diagnose your presentation? See, any patient assess the age, assess the nutrition status. In case of pediatric, the growth, vitals, all those things supposed to be recorded in a prompt manner. And you need to document the weight and body mass index along with the height charting. Everything has to be anthropometric measurements to be done in pediatric. Assessing the severity of even how much of episodes of diarrhea, clinical recognition of the pointers, clinical recognition of the extra GA presentation. Look for the joints, any swelling, any tenderness. Look for the skin, any evidence of nodular changes. Look for the eyes and look for the liver. Look for any changes of organomegalies and look for evidence of any pruritic mass, scratch mass, and look for any evidence of thyroid changes. So clinical puncture is very important to recognize your evil. And biochemical, nothing but so many lab workup starts from your basic hematogram along with your inflammatory cascade for your ESR, CRP, your CBC, these basic things will pick up nowadays new marker like your calprotectin, lactoferrin, so many other things are there. <coughs> but the basic biochemical pointers we are not supposed to forget. Stool examination doesn't going to reveal you much. In case if it's needed, we can proceed if we are going to suspect evidence of a bleed. But cross-section imaging, histological endoscopic is very important not to miss out the findings. Diagnostic approach, as we all know, look for the pro-inflammatory markers, your CBC. And in case always we need to see if the patient is going to have predominantly iliocolonic lesion, look for evidence of tuberculosis because it's very common in Indian scenario. If you're going to treat a patient with isolated ileocecal region, even if the patient is going to have suspected evidence of Crohn's, you need to treat for tuberculosis for some time. You need to assess the clinical presentation. That's the most important thing. And when you're doing your biopsy, you need to confirm whether the patient is not going to have evidence of tuberculosis. Because once the patient is going to start the treatment on steroids, at that point of time, I have seen multiple patients who had flaring of tuberculosis and the patient succumbed to the nature of disease because of septicemia and septic shock and develop. So always you need to recognize the patient where evidence of TB is there or not. So do the proper workup. And before starting the patient on monoclonal antibodies for this kind of Crohn's and severe disease, so what are you supposed to do? 
all major infections like your live vaccine based infection for example herpes simplex your your varicella along with your cytomegalovirus all the basic infections work up your tuberculosis is very common not supposed to forget all these basic infections work up you're not supposed to miss when you're going to touch any monoclonal antibodies for cause it's going to alter your immune response it's going to suppress your immune response at that point of time you may have worsening of events so always we should not miss any represent any presentation and we need to inform the patients as well as the attender to report to us promptly even the patient is going to land up with the evidence of minimal complications even post treatment scenario <coughs> stool tests fecal calprotectin and various gi infections like your c difficile e coli campylobacter your asinia your salmonella shigella all those things as well as your endoscopic and histological investigation we are not supposed to miss and apart from that the major differential diagnosis based upon your uc and crohn's is <coughs> the most common differential diagnosis will be acute self limiting colitis as you all know and next to that your amebias is most commonly might be and your ibs might be a presentation but usually endoscopy doesn't reveal anything much other common differential diagnosis your vascular events like your bechets oral lesions we should not miss your celiac this is your gluten sensitive enteropathy is very common scenario which not miss other differential you list of diagnosis based upon your drug your radiation risk your diversion risk diversion colitis any diverticular colitis any ischemic colitis and you're not shown in scopura you list of differential diagnosis is there but the clinical pointers will bring you to the conclusion that this is because of ibd most of the time <laughs> next to that how do you going to differentiate your uc from your cd so one is because as you are told you the most important thing you see predominantly involves your large bowel and cd will be predominantly restricted to your small bowel uh, i mean predominantly restricted to your bowel small bowel to large bowel but once the patient is going to have typical you see the patient will be having predominantly bloody diarrhea endoscopy the inflammation will be usually superficial but rectum involvement will be the most of the time but this can be patchy shallow ulcers and erosion spontaneous is bleeding maybe the but diffuse mucosa or sub mucosa inflammation will be the serological markers like ankyma tends to be positive but crohn's will be having predominantly transmural inflammation and the diarrhea mass weight loss all the things with evidence of malnutrition in case if the patient going to land up with the evidence of small bowel pathology malnutrition we are not supposed to get forget as most of the metabolic parameters being happening that apart from that involvement of ileum as well as right side of colon we should not mess along with cobblestone and mucosa various ulcers longitudinal as well as fissuring ulcer uh, lesions with predominant of granular metastasis changes in your histopathological evaluation and serological markers like aska and other things being there which can be used to aid in your diagnosis but unfortunately there is no one single patient serological marker to diagnose your ibd basically these are all the things we need to treat assessing the clinical presentation look for the differential features do a endoscopy colonoscopy in case in case if you are going to recover uh, to assess your small bowel either capsule or endoscopy along with assessing the evidence of inflammation then you need to decide the treatment protocol treating ibd you need to explain the disease nature it's a long term treatment process and need to counsel the patient to be in regular follow up and look for the severity of disease and look whether the disease is predominantly which pattern of ibd whether it's uc or cd where the disease has been predominantly located what is the phenotypic nature what are the various comorbidities with the patient's diabetic hypertensive all the patient's short stature growth retardation failure to thrive so many other complications if you are going to touch your pediatric as well as the adult population and next to that whether the patient is having any previous medical response whether the patient has been responded to any previous therapy now the patient is having evidence of relapse whether the patient be access financial status 
for the diagnostic workup as well as treatment options and the course and nature of the illness, all of these pointers to us is before you're going to touch any patient with management, in management of IBD. The goal is most of the time we need to improve the quality of lab. The stool severity has come down, supposed to improve. The endoscopic severity is supposed to get improved. Apart from that, the histological pointers, it will take time to respond, but it has to get respond. And then the quality, the way nutrition state is supposed to get well preserved. And we need to eliminate the complications like fissures and fistulizing and complex abscess formation. Apart from that, we need to maintain with minimal remission with corticosteroid free remissions has to be assigned and prevent complications and various transformation to our malignant changeovers. And good nutrition has to be well maintained when you're going to target your patient with this IBD. The, in the armamentarium of management of IBD, huge or more list of drugs, so many new amounts continuously being in your management of IBD. But basic thing, we are not supposed to dip, uh, forget about your amino salicylates. In which even if the patient going to land up with evidence of mild or moderate or severe, we need to decide about your amino salicylates. which is nothing but the muscle as and you're going to use very also there's so many components but simply i would like to state you one simple thing what is the action mechanism of action of this amino salicylate it may take your anti-inflammatory cascade and it is going to affect your immunosuppressive pathway it is going to act on free radical scavenging and is also having evidence of your uh, <coughs> antioxidant So what you're going to do once you're going to consume which we are going to take, it is going to enter into a small bowel and from there to large bowel. And what is going to happen? It is going to take on into your liver from there to blood, kidney, as well as it's going to get eliminated in your urine. So the main area of action, it is going to inhibit your prostate glandings. That's very important. And it is going to inhibit your liquid trains and it is going to act on your PPA, or proximal proliferation receptors, neutrophil chemotaxis, decrease your liquid trains, as well as this is going to have evidence of anti-inflammatory cascade, as well as free radical scavenging. These are all the properties are there to take on when you're going to manage a patient with IBD with amino salicylate. There are various preparations available in the market. One is based upon your diffusion dependent. For example, your pentasa can be based upon your diffusion dependent and pH dependent molecules that are based upon your colonic pH, which is going to get released, and colonic flora based upon your gut microbiota that is going to be having preparations. And there are topical formulations based upon your severity. You can use your topical formulations, rectal formulations being available, which is going to involve predominantly up to the splenic flexure most of the time. So there are a huge list of formulations are there for your amino salicylates, starting from your dose of 1.2, 2.4, 4.8 grams per day as a combination, predominantly 2.4 grams twice daily. So most of the time will be recommended. And when you're going to manage a patient with amino salicylate, but isolated management of amino salicylates, not much of guidance. We need to combine either with steroids along support once the patient is going to have evidence of uh, with uh, moderate to severe colitis, but Isolated amino salicylate might be having some minimal response, but steroids to be continued in the armamentarium of management of IBD. And among steroids, prednisolone is a prototype starting from 40 to 60 milligrams per day. You can combine butisonide, nine milligrams, even single dose preparations initially tried with three milligrams twice daily. Now nine milligrams, OD butisonide preparation. And methylprednisolone, once the patient is going to have severity, Severe worsening of lesions, I and I record all those things you can try with immune modulators like various immune modulators. When you're going to start the patient on steroids slowly, you need to add on with azotioprine. And when you're going to start the patient with azotioprine, you need to monitor the black profile counts and all those things. You need to look for the polymorphisms like your TPMT alterations and mercaptopurine and other so much of you. List of molecules are there. Methotrexate, many patients nowadays being treated now with this molecule also if the patient doesn't show, seems to have response with azotioprine. But monoclonal antibody like infliximab initially been tried, adalimumab definitely. Now vedalizumab more available well in the market, we can try with once <clears throat> monthly dose based regimen be there. 
apart from your antibiotics like your metronidazole as a support based upon your inflammation and the basic approach for your mild moderate and severe nature so what you are going to start with aminosalicylates and topical preparation with oral i mean uh, topical budesonide or oral budesonide but corticosteroids like prednisolone are going to initiate for moderate severity and biologicals you can consider once a patient is going for severe nature of the disease and if the patient doesn't going to respond at that point of juncture we need to consider for surgical intervention so the basic algorithm you are not supposed to forget it almost remains similar with your uc as well as crohn's but the management of uc with mild moderate and severe the most important thing mild nothing much topical mesalazine at a rate of almost approximately around 4.8 grams per day and monitor the patient for response if the patient is not responding start the patient on steroids and response is not there then step up with azathioprine along with steroids with tapering regimen but once the patient is going for moderate severity the same my management with oral steroids mesalazine similarly like azathioprine response and nothing works on start with adalimumab so infliximab or adalimumab but adalimumab most of the time is potential for me because of humanized monoclonal antibiotic support when you are going to use that adalimumab we can do choose a dose of 160 mg bolus followed by 80 mg you yeah, uh, consecutively in the dose when you are going to use a management and once or twice monthly once in fortnightly you can use alimo for a period of almost around 2 years of duration which shows a significant response when you are going to treat a patient with ibd uh, recently we have been treated more than 5 to 6 patient over a period of last 2 to 3 months with alimo above and most of the patient showed significant response when you are going to manage in this ibd and severe is very complex entity you need to counsel you need to take care of the nutrition avoid all worsening events like narcotics anticholinergics fluids and aldrides management sometimes the patient may have worsening of vasculitis so apparent other things to be looked into that and uh, you need to look for evidence of other major dangerous infections like your cmv which you mimics your clostridium difficile may mimic all those things you need to see start the patient on injectable steroids and once a patient show no response then you need to augment either with monoclonal antibodies or your cyclosporine and other drugs if the patient doesn't show any response then you need to consider the patient for surgical intervention to prevent further worsening of complications and the basic algorithm for crohn's remains the same what i have discussed but once a patient show evidence of mild to moderate start with budesonide and remission just i mentioned with the fiac as is for no remission you need to step up with the systemic steroids and then mention with your asa azd as well as six mecaptopurin once a patient doesn't show any response at that point of time you can start the patient on biologics and let's look for the response even after that there is no response take the patient for surgical intervention so indication for surgery if there is no response to medical management and worsening of events complex fistulas but most of the time if the patient is going to be added to complex uh complex fistula in the case the patient is going to develop if you are going to manage a patient with proper biologic support and proper infection control most of the time the fistula is leech will heal well but even after that there might be some indication but you need to look into the literature some fistula is leech even will have a catastrophic effect to the patient post surgery so to whom we need to take for surgical intervention is supposed to be very cautiously decided when you are going to manage a patient with your ibd and look for various complications your structures very structurizing mucosa of fibrocystic lesion and bowel obstruction and once a patient is going for malignant change over like your dysplastic mucosa and cancerous mucosa at the point of juncture you need to take on for surgical intervention huge list of surgical procedures are there based upon your pouch anastomosis and renal <clears throat> resection all those things are there to look for your surgical intervention apart from that there are no no newer therapies been tried like mini molecules been used in your ibd your various new biologics been tried but one pointer rule out all co existing infections choose the patient for biologics and based upon the various trials which biology based upon the financial status you need to look into that clinical picture you need to look into that and you are going to choose a biology which doesn't mean if the patient not responding to one biologic so we can switch out to another biologics but 
caused constraints in financial issues that strongly to be assessed when you're going to manage a patient in India, along with evidence of septicemia development, with evidence of inflammatory marker or casket is going to take on or not. All those pointers you need to see promptly when you're going to manage a patient with IBD. Apart from that, so new, novel therapies <laughs> like your mini molecules, what have been considered like your less than finite delta and so many other things are there. Oral route, like so basic things before we are going to wind up this session, you should not forget like your mini molecules, like your sphingosin modulators, your JAK kinase inhibitors, JNS kinase inhibitors, and SMATS nucleotide antisense pathway, SMAT7 inhibitors and phosphodiesterase inhibitors, so many other things are there to be considered mini molecules management protocol, but we need more and more papers to validate this. And new list of your molecules being tried. For example, now we are well using this verilizumab in the market right now, and you can consider ostekinumab, which is also being tried very well. Apart from that, anti-trafficking molecules like ozanimod being tried very well as a sphingosin modulator, but we need more papers to validate this. I think, uh, yeah. And this is outline of the various thing where, where is the cascade of your molecules being located in the pathways. So this is basically when you're going to uh, take your inflammatory event and uh, when you're going to manage a patient with your various biological support, how are you going to get action? This is a various outline mechanism, alteration of your T-regulatory, your immune DNF pathway, your camp mediated pathway, along with evidence of integrins pathway. And this is all the microbiome, your gut microbiome, biomyota alteration and intestinal inflammation, all those things is going to act on this pathways. And there is a huge list of molecular support being tried when you're going to manage a patient with IBD. And this is all the basic mechanisms in which interleukin 12 antagonists like this chicken have been tried 23 and chain of antagonists you list are there based upon your adalimumab and infliximab. And nowadays, even your alpha antagonist, your alpha 4, beta 7, your vedalizumab be well tried, but daralizumab can be tried. But one thing you need to look for your uh, uh, worsening of your viral infections, your for jails and other diseases that might be evidence of uh, worsening of events, your CNS disease may worsen, and all those things you need to see promptly when you're going to manage a patient with uh, this uh, various monoclonal antibody support. This is all the various ongoing trials being happened from 2020 to 23 to 24, and there are so many papers being done nowadays, been looking for the various new molecules in the armor manchurium to manage a patient with IBD. But this is not the main indication. You should remember that these are all the molecules being tried, like your brazicumab, as well as your mechizumab, as well as in the galaxy, galax one. So what is this, guzilcumab, as well as chickenumab, various trials are there, and gardenia protocols, and hibiscus. See, if you're going to see the papers of your ongoing eight to eight trials in IBD, there are a huge list of pathways being there when you're going to see and as the day progress, we can able to come to the conclusion what's the thing. One molecule to is world phase 5 and 10 milligrams, well available in the market. When you're going to use as the octave trial, we can consider for mild to moderate. Nowadays, even papers code for the severe colitis, you can try. But how do you want to assess the response over a period of one month, six months, and six, uh, 12 months, and 18 months of period? We need more papers to augment the effects of uh, your tofacet name. And other molecules like your uh, uh, that uh, filgotinib, as well as upadacitinib, all those things we need papers to augment the support. As of now, not well being used, facilitated, well recognized. And apart from the, the summary, what you are going to see the CDA once a patient is going to have a clinical response is going to improve. If the CDA Crohn's disease index, if it is going to be less than 150, the papers are there to document five milligrams as well as 10 milligrams. These are all the basic trends we should not forget. But one thing, what I before come to, what I was supposed to say, it's a chronic event, relaxing event, remitting event, which is predominantly affecting your GA tract. You're not supposed to forget the management. And it's very important to recognize your UC as well as Crohn's. And in case of Crohn's long-term support, 
you see recognizing for early dysplastic as well as malignant changes and apart from that the prevalent nature and the basic work of what is best possible based upon the clinical status financial status and what is the basic thing what is the molecules which is the best molecule to choose and how are you going to assess the response whether the patient clinically responding nutrition responding growth is improving biochemical responses there lab parameters is improving anemia settling stool pattern gets normalized and endoscopy mucosal healing is very important histological graining has to come down and based upon whether the new medication and recognize the extra these things is very important if you're going to manage a patient with inflammatory bowel disease and with this i'm happy to rest my presentation i'm happy to take on kindly mute yourself whatever the questions i'm happy to answer you thank you very much for patient listening